again, thank you for coming. Very, very nice for you all to take time, especially, you know, Christmas shopping, everybody's busy, so I'm just really excited about having a nice crowd here. What you? She's always giving me orders, that girl. <laughs> Once she got to be the mayor, boy. Tell you. How's that sound? Is that better? Okay. <laughs> you know I love you. <laughs> okay, I think we can get this figured out here in a minute. But what you're about to hear today is one of New Orleans' most wanted crime stories. <laughs> After my book, Threads of Evidence, came out, I had a call from a screenplay writer from St. Paul, Patrick Coyle, who called me and he said, Jim, I love your book. I said, thank you. And he said, I think it would make a great movie. <laughs> And I said, you know, I, I, I think it could. You know, it would be an interesting story. And he said, yeah, he said, it's got jealousy, frustration, desperation, and suspense all wrapped into one. So he, uh, he's called me a couple times, uh, and I was really interested until he said, well, get a bunch of your friends together and raise about $60,000. <laughs> so that's why you're all here today. So Connie, Connie will take the money as you walk out. <laughs> no, he was serious. And the interesting thing is her, Lily, his wife, and they are screenwriters, and they've done a lot of movies. Uh, she's, her grandparents are from here, and that's what intrigued him. So I thought that was kind of an interesting, interesting thing. But, so we'll see. I, I don't think it'll ever make a movie because I'm not about to write a check for more than $5. <laughs> That'd be my share. But anyways, they share with the story with you today. I'm going to try to answer the most frequently asked questions. Why he did it? How he did it? And was there an accomplice? So as Paul Harvey would say, here's the rest of the story. <laughs> I liked him. That day back then still haunts me, and I'll never forget it. It was uh, March 9th, 1979. I was seated in the Blue Earth County Courthouse and I was there to hear how Fred Miney would uh, plead to the crime he was charged with committing against our family's clothing business over a two and a half year period. We would discover that the haberdasher and next door neighbor by day would mysteriously transform into a human nightcrawler in the shadows of night. You know, I just never expected that when I came from Morgan off the farm, something like that would happen. And we just, you know, it's just kind of crazy. But. Judge Miles Zimmerman presided over the hearing, and after reading the complaint which charged Fred Miney Jr. with the crime of wrongfully, unlawfully, feloniously, and intentionally removing our property without our consent, he asked Fred if he understood the charge against him. He answered, I do. Then the judge asked him, how do you plead to that charge? And Miney looked down at the floor and barely audibly said, guilty. Upon hearing the guilty plea, I breathed a sigh of relief. After months of desperately trying to get our inventory back so we could uh, sell it and pay some bills, there was finally light at the end of the tunnel. The oddities and what makes the story so surreal is that it happened in downtown New Orleans, actually about two blocks from where we're sit sit sitting right now. And uh, the other thing was, you know, Fred's sister Hazel was the chamber executive and I was very involved in the chamber, and uh, so she was a very good friend of mine. I thought the world of Hazel, and I felt so bad because she was absolutely just devastated when this happened. So Fred was 59 years old. I was 12. No, I was 33. <laughs> Most of us think of night crawlers as big, kind of big, fat worms that come out in the dark after a warm summer night's rain. But night crawlers can come in other forms, too. They sometimes wake us up in the middle of the night when we're sleeping. I guess we'd have to be before they wake us up. Uh, and they try to put fear and worry in our minds about our family, our finances, our business, and other life challenges. We were unfortunate enough to discover that, the night, that night crawlers even come in human form. It's my hope that by telling this story, it may help you in your daily life or business by giving you courage 
to not allow night crawlers to rob you of success and happiness. The night crawler that slithered into our store tried to thwart our business by sealing our clothing a piece or two at a time. After his arrest and conviction, conviction Fred Miney Jr. would be remembered for slithering his words through a hole he created in our common wall basement door to rob us of thousands and thousands of dollars worth of our inventory. He was desperate and almost bankrupt with little or no merchandise to sell. One fateful day, he stumbled onto a way to secretly gain entrance or access to our store. Ironically, it was staring him right in the face all along. Walt up there. Next slide, Connie. Yep. You're getting paid a lot of money for this. You've got to be on your toes. <laughs> People asked us about after the robbery how we were able to get um, a smile back on our face and <laughs> stay in business. People even asked me the outrageous question, did the experience make you a better person and businessman? Ironically, my answer was yes and yes. With the help of our family, friends, employees, and one friend in particular, there he is, hey Walt. I met Walt Woodard, this gentleman, while attending one of his roping clinics in Nebraska. Walt uh, tra trained us to become better ropers, most of us anyway, but the most important words he said were, People who think great have great things happen. And then you see that little uh, sign I have over on that table. <laughs> if you were to ask my kids, even as it's been a long time ago since we did this, but uh, what does your dad always say? Uh, People who think great have great things happen. <laughs> um, you know, Walt's phrase is so simple. But you know, everything good starts in the morning when you hop out of bed. Now, I don't hop, I kind of roll out. But, <laughs> Uh, you know, you've got to get that got to get started right, and you've got to have that positive and high, happy attitude, and appreciate appreciate be appreciative. I'm sorry for family, friends, good health, and happiness. You know, it's, people talk about visioning a great day when you get up, and I, I think that's so true because when you get out of bed, you think, mm, you know, sometimes hurt here, hurt there, but if you vision, it's kind of what you see is what you get. Great golfers like my friend Bill. Uh, vision, uh, when they step up to the tee box, they vision a beautiful 250-foot drive right down the middle of the fairway, the ball just plunking on the, the green, cutting green. And baseball players vision hitting a home run with the crack of the bat before they go up the plate, they just see that ball going through the air. And preachers, ministers, they see their church pews full of happy people singing on Sunday morning. So the famous New York slugger, uh, Yankee slugger Babe Ruth said, don't let fear of striking out keep you from playing the game. I got a good example of that. Because when I got through with my rodeo and horses, and the doctor said, you know, we've replaced just about everything. You know, if you keep riding, I don't know what, what more we can do for you. So, but, you know, um, when I was going to go from the saddle to the golf course, uh, I thought, well, yeah, you know, anybody should be able to hit a golf ball pretty easy. I mean, that's just sitting right there, you know, I mean, that's, that'd be simple. And so I went out with a friend, and actually Gary Nelson, my, which he ended up being a brother-in-law later on, but Gary and I went out, and Gary said, I'll teach you how to play golf. So, you know, he, we, I took a few swings at the ball and, and uh, whiffed most of the time and went, you know how that goes. If you've ever played golf, it's very intimidating. And then the... <laughs> I finally went out to play on, on like on a men's day here in, in New Ulm, and uh, this was a long time ago, but I uh, got out on the green and I tried to tee off. There's about four or five people standing there waiting to, to follow up, you know, and follow us, and that's kind of scary when you know you're going to hit the ball one foot and everybody else hits it <laughs> 300 feet. But, you know, I, I, I mean, it really bothered me. I was, I was just kind of, oh, this, I got through nine holes and I thought, you know, I can't think of anything I'd rather not do. <laughs> so then I got home and I started thinking about it. I was sitting in my chair. I hadn't rung the bell yet for another beer, but I think I was sitting in my chair. <laughs> and um, I started thinking, well, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back and try it again. 
And, and I did. Wasn't much better, but I kept working at it. I'm still a bad golfer, but now I don't, I'm not intimidated. It's, you know, so. But it's, it's great. And I think that's the thing in life we have to re, really remember that uh, you, you can make it happen. You just got to hang in there and not give up. But anyway, um, so people who think great have great things happen. It's kind of what you see is what you get. Walt Woodard made that, that phrase, and, and uh, wrote that, coined that phrase, and, and we heard it so much during his roping schools, and it really got to be part of my kind of everyday life, and I just thought it's such, such a great way to look at things. Uh, the great speaker, Harvey McKay, said it just the same thing, but a little different. He said, it's, people used to say what you see is what you get. He said it's actually what you think is what you get. So there's so, so much truth in that. So that horse right there, the horse is on the right, um, <laughs> was my, you know, Roy Rogers had trigger. Some, some of you young people won't remember that, but um, this is Peso. He was the greatest buddy, uh, my greatest rope horse. I, I loved him. I just wanted to show a picture of him. Uh, a lot of people show pictures of their grandkids. <laughs> but I wanted you to see Peso. He was a, I bought him in Oklahoma City. And I roped on him for a long time. He and I traveled a lot of miles together. He was my all-time favorite horse, and uh, I just have to show a picture once in a while. His name was Peso, and he is a terrific rope horse, an equine athlete. <coughs> Probably the best horse. What well, he was the best horse. You know, old, cow old cowboys see every horseman gets one really great horse in his lifetime, and that was mine. So. Well, my road to becoming a retailer began in 1963. I got a job working in Springfield at Kingery's Department Store. And I just love the retail business. I was kind of between in my life between I, I know what, what I want to do, but I don't know what I want to do. And that was a good, good experience for me. And I really did. I loved the job. I loved everything about it. And by the way, Springfield is one of the nicest small towns in the world, I think. Great people, uh, all kinds of good things about Springfield. It's really a nice town, a high-class town. And that was where my mother grew up, by the way. Not that that has anything to do with it, but... Um, <laughs> So I got a job working at Kingery's and learned the business. Carl Kingery trained me, to, trained me a little bit and then just said, he kind of turned me loose and said, you just go sell, you do whatever you want and do the marketing. And so I really got a lot of great experience. And then in 1966, I was offered a job at Luthol Neubauer's men's store just down the road here a little bit. I accepted the offer, started my new job, moved to New Ulm, met Connie, and probably did this best sales job I ever did in my life. <laughs> and I convinced her to marry me. So she, after, you know, I don't know how many tries that was, but she, so, so we moved, we moved, so in 1966 we got married, new job, and uh, moved to New Orleans. It was a great year. In 1970, after working for Hugo Neubauer for a few years, um, I was offered a job to work at Herberger's, which was a nice offer and anyway he told me turn it down he was in Arizona when I called him I wanted to talk to him about it and he said um, no don't take it when I get back in the spring you can buy the store you should you should take it over and uh, so I decided to do that and I called my dad and I said dad yeah, guess what I want to buy a clothing store and he said hmm with what and I said <laughs> <laughs> I said I didn't get I don't I haven't get that part for, figured out yet but I'm sure we'll talk about it so that's how we got to know him. And uh, I had wonderful 40 years on, the, on Main Street and loved every minute of it. I miss it every day. So the next picture, there it is, cow milking contest. And as our business continued to grow and uh, kept keep the to keep the momentum moving forward, we promoted and advertised very aggressively. I mean, we, we did a lot of promotions. I was out at Farm Fest and I was at every fair and I mean, everything we did, we, we promoted hard. <coughs> But one of the fun events we did is this picture you see of me milking a cow, and that's not all that great, but what was really funny was Tommy Lindemann brought that cow into his music store. <laughs> he called me one day and said, Jimmy, I got an idea. I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a cow, cow milking contest. And he said, I want you to go up against Harold Laufenmacher. <laughs> you know, everybody knows Harold Laufenmacher is a great, great band leader, Six Fat Dutchman. And so he said, we're going to promote it, and, we'll, and, then, uh, and, and then we're going to build a promotion around it. You can get your store involved in that. So we did. Harold actually beat me 
by a pull or two, uh, <laughs> believe it or not. And I was a farm boy. But uh, he ended up falling or rolling off the stool, true story, and fell in the straw and other, you know, things that were in the straw. <laughs> and uh, it was aired live on KNUJ Radio, our lovely, wonderful station we have here. And with Perry Galvin at the mic, the legendary, great Perry, Perry Galvin at the mic. We had a, that was a really fun thing we did. And I've got to give Tom the credit, it was his idea. In 1973, uh, after three years of solid business growth as owners of the store, opportunity knocked. We had the option to lease the Fab and Trim building. Most of you probably won't remember that, but there was a place right next door called the Fab and Trim. I don't even know for sure what's in that building now. I'd have to stop and think about it. But anyways, right next to our store, um, to our immediate south. So we negotiated the lease, and um, with that, exp you know, we were, with that extra addition, uh, we were uh, about twice our size, and we were sharing now sharing a wall and a basement door with mining clothing. <coughs> I really didn't know Fred very well. I hadn't really had a chance to visit with him too much, but you know, I'd always greet him when I'd see him and everything. Um, but I went to visit with him after noticing there was a door left open in the basement, because now we had this, this extra space and we hadn't done anything with it yet. We hadn't started remodeling. But I went downstairs shortly after we signed the lease and I looked and I said, hmm, that's unusual. Because there was a door to his, the store between our wall and into his basement. I thought that seemed a little unusual. So um, he explained to me, he said, well, that's, that's because, you know, you have to understand, that's because this actually is, there's two businesses in one building. And that's the bathroom we both use. So that has to stay open. I said, no. He said, yes. I said, no. I said, Fred, I said, it doesn't matter. We have our own bathroom. Those people aren't going to be using it anymore because they're going out of business, the Fab and Gym ladies. So you've got your own bathroom. Why would we leave the door open? He said, well, I don't know. He was very adamant about it. He was not happy. He said, well, I just don't want that one locked. He said, I think for all kinds of reasons. Okay, so as soon as I get back to the store, I called uh, Roger's Walk at Walk Welding, and I said, Roger, I want a big iron bar welded up that will go so many inches wide and thick. I want a big, solid uh, lock put on there. So I said, get it done as quick as you can. And he came over and he did it in a day or two. So we were now, uh, after that, I was comfortable. The door was locked. No more worries about security. And... Uh, our opening was getting closer. Customers were starting to get excited because we had the new store and we started, they could see people in the remodeling and building and we'd, we'd done some promoting about what we were going to do. We were going to add all kinds of new lines, shoes for one thing. Um, and uh, so the things are things on a roll. So after about a year of opening the new addition, Ronald Bryan, who was our Luthold company, I was in partnership with the Lutholds. They owned, I owned 59% uh, and they had 49. 50, he had 51, they had 49. I'm not very good at math. Uh, we had, we had uh, the majority of ownership. So anyway, Ronald Bryan, our C CFO, contacted me about our year-end financial statement. He said, you know, this is it. We'd been, you know, going for a while, and so I'm moving the clock ahead a little bit. He said, you know, are you, are you guys having a problem with shoplifting in, that store, in your store? And I said, no, I don't think so. And he said, well, uh, the, we just took the inventory, and he said, it looks like you're, you've got a lot of shrinkage. That's what I need. I need a lot of shrinkage. Not that kind of shrinkage. But I was, I said, I don't think so, Ron. I said, we wait on everybody. I mean, nobody, you know, somebody walks in, we talk to them, we, we don't follow them around and heckle them, but we sure, you know, are there if they need us. Um, you know, we, we would notice that once in a while, maybe something, did, did you sell that nice pink shirt we had or something? You know, no, you know. So there was like some of that, but nothing major. So it went on and on and on, a few more months and a few more months. and. What really got me going was I had a guy from Gibbon that came in and ordered a new suit. And it was a Hart Chapman Marks. And back in those days, that was an exp expensive brand. And it was a gorgeous suit, kind of a brown with a little tick weave. I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about. And um, anyway, so I hung it in the back room where we kind of kept our layaways and special orders and things like that. And I called him and I said, you know, told him the suit was in. Come on in and take a look at it. It looks great. You're going to love it. And he said, OK, I'll be over tomorrow. Great. He walked in and um, I said, I'll go get your suit. Walked to the back room, the suit was gone. I said, Steve, my assistant manager, Steve Jacobson, Steve, did you sell that suit he said, that we ordered for this guy? And he said, no. I asked a couple other people, no one, no one had seen it. 
So now I'm thinking, something's going on here. So that's when the, I kind of hit the panic button and started to, trying to figure out what, what, what was going on. And uh, it just was kind of crazy. So now I'm going to tell you something. Uh, and then as time went on, you know, things progressed a bit negatively. But I'm going to tell you something today that will be the first time I've ever told anybody this. So this is why you're here, <laughs> to hear this. And it's in, it begins with an incident that occurred in 1975. We, we, bought the, we bought the store in 1970. This is about 1975. And I came to work early one morning. Well, I usually came in early. And I went down to our main store basement to make co the coffee. That was really my job at the store. <laughs> and um, so I went down to make coffee. And when I did reach the bottom of the stairs, I noticed that uh, I noticed a light coming in from the back of the basement. And these old basements, I mean, they're, they're weird anyway. They're, they're kind of, you know, they've been, maybe those, some of those buildings got to be 100 and, what, 150 years old? I mean, and so, they're, you know, there's, it's not, they're, not, they're not pretty, most of them. But I could see a light coming in from the back, and I thought, what the heck is that? So I walked back, and I, uh, I noticed that there was two big doors in the basement that went to the outside, uh, and then there were up a couple steps you could, you know, park back there, and, but it was a, it was kind of a recess type stairs going down below. I mean, I know this is really confusing when I'm saying it, but there was a, kind of a loading dock, and then the stairs went down, and then the big two doors. But there we go. And they were open, and they were they'd been beaten up pretty badly, and they were wide open. And I, so I just thought, what the heck? So I. I Ran upstairs thinking, I wonder if somebody stole something, you know, right away. It's the first thing you think of. And I looked around, and I could see that we had, back, that was the time when leather jackets were, I mean, they, they kind of went in on a style, but they were really popular back then. And we had ordered a lot of leather jackets, so, you know, with the anticipation of selling them, obviously. But I looked, and there was a rack that we had about, had about 50 jackets on, and we were down to about, um, no, just a handful. So that's what, that's what was gone. So we were missing the jackets, and I thought, oh, gosh. So I called Bert Shoppicum. Six foot four, Bert, big smile, always happy. Hi, Bert. Great guy. He used to come up behind us, and we'd be walking with the kids. The young ones were in the store and kind of walking up there. And he'd come up behind us and put his, he had this little microphone they could turn on. Jensen's pull over, you know. <laughs> the kids would go, oh, you know. He was a great guy. He assumed it was a hit and run thing. He said, I think what happened, he said, I'm seeing some of this and we're seeing some of this in the big cities where they come in and they, they want something, they, you know, when they come in and check your, you know, store out, you know, scope things out. And then they come back at night and they'll break in and find a way to get in and, and they probably did that. That's probably what happened. And then they took the, you may never, you probably never see it from them again. I hope you, hope you don't anyway. Um, so we were thinking that maybe it was what happened. I called my uh, insurance agent, and he came over, and he said, well, yeah, well, get, get us in, get us, try to get us an inventory, and we'll, we'll pay it. So I got a check for about $7,000 and thought, yeah, it's not a bad deal. So I was going to call the people and have them come back again, but I didn't. But, um, <laughs> but I got paid, and I ordered more jackets, and, you know, life was good. And then um, before he left, I said, I said, you know, Bert, I said, I, we're concerned about shrinkage or you know people were missing merchandise and he said well I'll, I'll look around and he said you think some I said I think somebody's getting into a store and he said well how would they do that and I said I don't know I guess if I knew that I, I wouldn't have the problem but anyway he uh, he said well I'll, let me look around a little bit so he and I said well go down to the basement because I you know I, we've we've got locks and all the doors up here and we get you know I I'm just not sure how they, anybody could be getting in and anyway, he looked around, he checked everything all out. He said, well, here's what I would do, since this just happened. He said, and, and, uh, but in the, the, the door in the basement, they, they literally kicked in. I mean, it's hard to explain, and you wouldn't think it's, uh, you know, you wouldn't think one could do that, but that's the way it looked. But he said, change the locks upstairs, get new keys, you know, and make sure you keep, keep an eye on things. He said, have you thought about employee theft? I said, no. I haven't. And he said, well, I think that might be your problem. I said, no, I know it's not. I mean, but I, I thank you for that, but it's not, the, it's not the problem. 
we were really like family. I mean, our, our, we were so close to our employees. They were just wonderful, and, and they, they were like family. And I just couldn't possibly think anybody would do that, and they never did. I believe one of the reasons the doors were busted open like that and left that way was a detraction from our, that happened, and I think it would have been, Fred might have been, I, I don't know this for sure, because I can't prove it, but um, I think as, I, as it, years later, as I started thinking about this, I think that might have been a, a, like a decoy to get our mind off where he, had, where he was coming through, because you know, we never saw that either. But yeah, I think he thought, well, if they start looking, they're going to think somebody else was coming in and doing this. It isn't me. And I'm thinking how he might have perceived that. So some people say, how in the world couldn't you tell that was happening with me? You guys are a bunch of dummies. Uh, well, that, that we are. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, that was long before computers and all this kind of stuff. And so everything was done by hand. So, you know, if you had a few things missing now and then, you really, you really wouldn't notice it, especially when you got a big inventory. We were hanging probably two to 300 suits and sport coats at that time, and we had a big store, and we had a lot of business and a lot of inventory. So if somebody would come in and take a piece of two or three or four, even you, you really wouldn't notice it. And this was something you'd, you know, like that suit that was sold that we didn't, couldn't find. So if somebody would get in, uh, you know, and go through the store, it'd be hard to detect it. We wanted to be good neighbors with Fred. I, I, I didn't want any hard feelings between him, and, uh, but he never, I, I never, you know, I never liked trouble. I felt there was plenty of business for everybody. So we all tried to be nice and get along with him. Kind of even would bring him cookies once in a while when she made some for us guys. But uh, on several occasions, you know, I tried to break the ice with Fred and talk to him, and he just never responded or seemed very interested in talking to me. We even shoveled the sidewalk. If the snow would come down heavy, I'd say to the guys, oh, well, you're doing ours, just do it, Fred. Because, you know, he's old. He seemed like an old guy. No, he seemed pretty young, actually. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, excuse me. Fred always seemed kind of alo aloof and distant. I just couldn't, I, you know, you can usually get people to kind of warm up to you, but I just could never, you know, I thought he was different, but I just hoped he was okay. I didn't, I didn't have much to do with him. It was March of 1978, the day before Easter. I was at the store and Connie called me and she said, I want you to meet me at Eichton's shoe store. We're gonna get, I'm going to get the kids new Easter shoes. I said, sure. I was you know, busy selling suits, but naturally I'd be happy to do that. <laughs> uh, so anyway. <laughs> yeah, she said, meet me at the store. I'll be there with the kids. And so um, I left the store and I said to Steve and my guys, I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll be back in 10 minutes. I gotta, we we're picking out shoes for the kids and I, I have to be there for that. So um, on the way over the, to the Eichton Shoe Store, I was chewing gum and I hate, hate it when, I always hated when people would come in with gum on their shoes and they'd get the carpet all sticky. So I was chewing gum and I was gonna be a good citizen and I was gonna throw that gum in the, in the receptacle in the corner which I did, and as I leaned over, I saw a bunch of these, exactly the same thing in the, hanger, in, the, in the garbage can. And being a thrifty retailer, which is what you have to be to stay in business and survive, I thought, I wonder why they're in there. I could, uh, those are good hangers. That's kind of silly, because we got to buy those every so often. We buy a case of them. So I, I kind of, then I kind of thought, is this, is this, you know, what's going on? This doesn't look quite right. But then I had to keep moving, so I just kind of threw the, the, the hanger back in, went back, and then went in the store, and Connie was waiting me, for me, and we, we uh, started, we got the shoes for the kids and all that, did all that stuff for Easter Sunday, and all decked out, looking good. And uh, as I went back to the, on the way back to the store, I thought, I'm just going to peek in there one more time. And I looked, there were several of these hangers in there, and I thought, well, I could, I could steal them from whoever threw them in there. <laughs> and... Uh, so I grabbed him out of there and I took him with me. I got back to the store and Steve Jacobson, I don't know how many of you, anybody know Steve? Remember Steve? Okay, quite a few. He's a naturally funny guy, great, one of the best salesmen I ever had. Fun guy, hard worker, but he's also like a little pit bull. If somebody makes him mad about something, he's like, you know. And the, so he, he saw me walk in with these hangers, Mary, and he knew I'd gone over to the, to the shoe store. And um, he said, what's the deal with the hangers? I said, I don't know, I'm going to get him in to come on back to my office. And so he was waiting, and somebody got done, he came back, and it was a busy day. Easter always was. And so I said, uh, I said, Steve, I found these in the, in the garbage receptacle. And I said, 
I don't know. It's just maybe they might have something to do with their missing merchandise. Could be, you know. And see, again, always the detective says, I'm going to go check it out. So I said, okay, good. Well, he returned with more hangers and a brown paper bag full of clothing labels and pieces of paper with the na name Fred Miney clothing on them. And Fred Miney this and Fred Miney that. And um, when we dumped them out on my desk and we looked at these things, then we also uh, labels from clothing that had been cut out of merchandise. We looked at each other and we went, Fred? Fred? Is that be possible? I called the uh, New Orleans Police Department. It was this, you know, Saturday, so we were really busy on Easter time. I spoke with uh, Doug Wiesner, who was a corporal, I think, at the time. Told him what I'd found, what we had found, and he said, "Well, I'll come right over, Jim, and see see if I can take a look and see what's happening." And and I was kind of, you know, these all these things are whirling through your head, thinking, "What the heck's going on here?" And uh, so I showed him the bag with the with the identification on it, and it was from Red Man Clothing, and. Uh, he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down to the basement if it's okay with you and take a look down the stairs area. And he did, and he looked around and came back, and he said, I don't see anything down there that looks like you know, it's out of place or any way anybody could get in. Um, so if everything's locked at night, I don't think you, you shouldn't have anything to worry about. But he said, uh, uh, I think it, it, it does kind of look a little, a little strange for Fred. He may be even involved. So later that day on Saturday, um, he insisted on coming. He called me. He said, "Jim, I'm going to come back. I want to look through your basement." This is again. This is a busy, busy day, and he brought a, a couple of flashlights and all kinds of things over there. I, of course, appreciated that. And he agreed when we told him we we, we think it might be have something to do with Fred, and he he, he must have found a way to get through be in, into our basement somehow. But how? Since it's locked and closed and. Wiesner said, I'm going to take a look around again. So you guys go ahead and go back and do, take care of your work and everything like that. So he, uh, he kept looking, kept looking, and examined the door panel and all these other places. And all of a sudden, he said, you know what? I think there's, I think there's a mark on that one door panel. And we looked at that thing 100 times. The, you know, it's the picture in the far right, my far right, your left. And I know it looks funny because you think, how could anybody crawl through that hole? And that is a good question. Um, but he said he noticed that there's a little scratch on the inside the, of the, 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 in, the insert or the you know, inset. And then he pushed a little bit of his finger and he realized, he said, this is where it's coming through. Uh, so it was like good and bad. You know, I knew that was going to, it was good because now we knew bad because I knew all hell was about to break loose. And so um, we knew. He said, I think somebody's stealing your inventory. I thought, yeah, I think so. And so we began you know, done wondering about the stolen items and so on. Anyways, uh, Steve remembered it. You know, we thought, well, we're, we're, what's what you doing with it? You know, and, and so Steve remem rem remembered a couple of, or a year ago or so that some of the plumbers had removed the pipe. You know, these basements and these old basements in the, in the stores, you know, there's beams about this, this big. They're huge. And somebody had drilled through to put a pipe through, like a water pipe through. And Steve said, I remember this, some plumbers were here, and they were talking about removing those pipes. He said, I bet we could, if we get a ladder, we could see through there and see what's going on. So, so he did. He got a ladder, and he climbed up there and scurried up there. And he looked, and he, he said, all he said to me was, oh, my God. He said, he's got tons of our clothing, and it's hanging right on the racks in, in his basement. I took a ladder, I got to look on the ladder and went up and took a look and almost got sick to my stomach. I was just like, it was just like something was buzzing in my head like, oh no, you know. For a bunch of reasons because I knew it was going to be really difficult. Um, so anyway, we, um, that's where it was. And Wiesner said to me, well, from now on in, the, the police and the county attorney are going to be taking over because, <laughs> you know, obviously, which was fine. So it's got you know. We then went through all the legal stuff and you know, all that kind of stuff, and and uh, I'll get to that in a minute. But so the question of why he did it, in Fred's desperation to find a way to slow down our success, I think, or better yet, put us out of business. I think he thought, I'm going to kill two birds with one stone because if I steal merchandise a little bit at a time, they're going to start getting you know start running out of money, and so I'll have their clothes and I'll put them out of business over time. 
Fred was very jealous of us. He, he, he met with me uh, after he was charged and booked. He met with me. He wanted his attorney called my attorney, and he said, Fred would like to clear the air with Jim. I thought, okay. So we met. And um, anyway, he was going broke, and he was desperate, like a wounded animal. I mean, he just he had, he had no, no business, no money. And the guy was, was in deep trouble. He had to find a way to get a new inventory to build his empty shelves. His plot was kind of clever. To, you know, like I said, it took care of two of his biggest problems, me and he got the merchandise. So how did he do it? Well, you know, he would, take, he would have to take a break in the, in the middle of the afternoon. Uh, not that I knew this, but at the time, there, there he, you know, he confessed. He would take a break and he would go uh, down to his, he would put a sign in the window, be back in 30 minutes or 20 minutes, whatever it was. And he would go down to his restroom uh, in, the, in the bottom of the stairs of his store. And there's where he would uh, uh, think and sit and plot, plot, T-L-O-T. Um, you know, and think about things that were bothering him and stuff. That was kind of his hiding spot. And evidently, one day while he was sitting there and staring at the door, almost touching his face, he remembered it was the same as the door which opened up into our store basement. So a plan began to hatch in his mind. If he could make it happen, it would solve a lot of problems. The big door had four large panels. He describes this in the book pretty, in pretty much detail, or in his confession, for sure. His plan would be to saw around the outside edge of the lower panel once he'd done that, he could put hinges on there so it could kind of come and go. It's like, kind of like a doggy door. No, no pun intended, no disrespect intended. But then he could take a, get, it, get it open, get up to our store, and, and take a piece or two of our inventory at a time and crawl back. He had the merchandise, no problem. He'd have a little, his own little wholesale store next door where he could get stuff for nothing. And then his plan was to remove, remove any kind of identification brands that he would find that might raise suspicion. So he is a little, had a rich seam ripper, we call him, and he was in there taking off the, the labels and you know, everything, and set a little pile of stuff, I'm sure. So, you know, um, no one would ever know what happened. He would be, we would be gone, we kept on taking our merchandise, and he would be in the driver's seat again. When Steve, uh, Jacobson was trying to solve the mystery, mystery of the vanishing merchandise before this happened, before we, caught, or before we knew what was Fred. He and I sometimes would go down to the store at night and because we figured if we sit there long enough, somebody's, you know, this is before I knew, we knew who it was, but we, we said somebody's going to be coming in sooner or later because they're getting our merchandise. So I picked him up one night, and, he's, and, and his wife Gail sent along a jar of pickles for me, because I love pickles. <laughs> and uh, one night, I ate just, we, Steve and I were drinking beer, and we were playing um, pool in their basement, and, and I went through about three jars of pickles. And Gay wasn't very happy with me, but she sent me a, a jar. But, so we went down to the store, and we did this in several, several nights, and we would sit there in the dark, hoping somebody would walk in, you know, and, and be a little crazy because I don't know what would happen. It's a good thing it never happened, but, uh, but we would sit there. But you know, in, the, in those old stores, they're, they're, they're heated with steam pipes. And every once in a while, they go bang, you know, real loud like that. We would both just about <laughs> come off the chair about that far. You know, your heart would be pounding in. Uh, yeah, so that's, you, could, you know, you could sit there, you try to be quiet because we didn't want to talk in case somebody would walk out of the shadows. And you can feel your, your heart beating, and you can hear your breath going in and out. And, you know, you're trying to be quiet, but it sounds loud when you're trying to be quiet. I really am glad we, we never encountered him, because it would, could have been pretty ugly. Um, after Fred pled guilty in, in the crime again, he wanted to, uh, at this time I talked about, to clear the air between us with our lawyers. We agreed to meet him, and, and uh, we, so it was pretty much Fred and I. Uh, though I guess there was, our lawyers were present, but they didn't say anything. He was very apologetic, but I, in what he told me, I had the feeling like he was thinking, um, you know, you, you really don't deserve to be a Noam, to be, you know, you're, you're not a Noam guy, and I hope you realize that. <laughs> but he, you know, he, he, he inferred certain things like, um, 
you know, I'm not sure, and this is kind of my conjecture, but I think he thought, I'm not sure this guy's even German, for God's sakes. <laughs> and, you know, he's just a farm boy from Oregon. He's got no business. I don't think he's, I don't even know if he went to high school. I'm not sure. But uh, he's not very bright. I know that. He could have been talking to my teachers. I never know. But anyway, um, <laughs> and then he said, uh, I said, well, I didn't say it, but I, I was thinking, well, I actually am half German. My mother was a Berberic. My dad is a Dane. So I'm half, halfway there during my rights. And uh, that's why I like sauerkraut and have a sweet Danish roll afterwards. So. <laughs> but again, um, it was just, not, it's, not, it's not, I guess, funny, but it is kind of funny. Um, but he just, again, he just saw me as somebody that probably should have never come to New Ulm in the first place. And one of the really funny things he said in his confession was, was funny. He said, after, um, yeah, after, after stealing $1,000 over their inventory, he wrote, as time went on, I felt the quality of the men's clothing was diminishing, <laughs> and I had, I had trouble finding things in Luther Jensen's that would meet my standards. <laughs> Talk about sticking a knife in me. That, that made me cringe. So, and you know, the other thing he would talk to me when he was con confessing what he did, making the confession, he talked about Sunday mornings. He said, you know, Sunday, I, he said, I did a lot at night, but then Sunday mornings was nice too because I knew that Jensen's went to the United Methodist Church on the corner, corner of Broadway and Center. And he said, I knew that, well, I don't know how he found out, but he, I suppose he probably come, everybody probably knew that we were Sunday school teachers, I'm sure it was big news. And um, he said, I knew they'd be there for two hours. I could look down through the alley, I knew where the car was parked, and I could get in and you know, go shopping for an hour and take what I wanted, and I knew they, I wouldn't be, nobody would walk in on me. So. So much for going to church, you know. But anyway, so you know, a customer said a customer. Oh, I talked about that. Oh no, no, I'm back on track here. I'm okay. Don't worry about me. Um, yeah, we had a customer come in the store, and he was going to buy a suit. And um, I'll, I'll wrap this up pretty quick so you can ask questions, but. He, he looked at our new suits for spring, and it was, he wanted to buy a, one of my Johnny Carson suits, which Johnny Carson had a nice line of suits back then. It was a pretty hot deal. And he was a 44X strong, which is a size that not a lot of men's stores carry, and we, we carried him. Uh, when he came back to buy it, he, he looked, and he said, I'll go get home and get Carolyn, and I'll come back, his wife, and, uh, and I'll probably take it if she likes it. But when he came back to look at it, it was gone. It had vanished. And I thought, no. Nah. So this is before we had found out Fred was stealing from us. But it's kind of an interesting story. So uh, anyway, I, I assumed that he had then. And after talking to the, the police and the county attorney and all these people, they said what we need, we're going to need is for somebody to go in and uh, go into Fred's store and buy something, get a receipt so that we can prove he's got your merchandise in there. Uh, so I said, okay. So um, I talked to the, when this guy came back to buy the the suit was missing, and I said, I called him, I said, would you consider coming down for a conversation? And he said, about what? And I said, well, I can't really tell you over the phone. Come on down. So he did, and I told him what, what the situation was, and I said, would you consider going in there and seeing if he's got that suit, and if he had it, if he has it, buy it. And I kind of told him what, what it was all about. He said, sure. So he purchased, he, he tried to buy it that day, and that was, uh, it was Easter uh, Saturday, but Fred had gone home. He had hung a sign in the window and said, you know, be back Monday. So he came over, and then we said, well, the, the police said, okay, Monday, come in and come back and buy the suit. So he did that. He came back, and he said, uh, he went over to Fred's store, and he said, why don't you see if you got anything to fit me? I'd like a nice spring suit, you know. And Fred says, you know, I think I do have one. He just came in. Let me, <laughs> let me go check it. So he went downstairs to the basement and brought, grabbed this suit and came up. And I remember the guy telling me, well, I stood in front of the mirror. And we told him we probably got the label down. He was looking. And, yeah, no labels. And um, that's what he said. So he knew it was probably the, the, uh, the right situation. So he said, I'll take the suit. 
And he said, you don't need to tailor it all. Just send my wife to it. But I need, you know, and then he said, okay. So he, he paid him for the suit, and, and he got a receipt, and he came over. And then, of course, then by then, the wheels of justice were starting to roll pretty fast. Um, it was funny. They tried to, they tried to get a search warrant. They tried to get, they needed a search warrant to check and see what, if he had the inventory in his basement just to make sure. And the judges were all having some kind of a big powwow at the Kaiserhof. That was the Monday after Easter. So um, one of the, uh, I, was, I was with Doug Wiesner and he said, why don't you come with me? So we went in, we went to the Kaiserhof and we tried to get a judge to come out. And, you know, they were kind of looking at us like, what? And anyway, finally uh, Judge Moriarty came out and we uh, showed him the, the situation and talked to him about what was happening. And I remember his words were, really? <laughs> really? Yeah, really. So he then, he did, a, you know, after checking things out a little bit, he did s sign the search warrant. But we had to go to the Kaiser after to find him. Uh, so once that was done, the police came down and they uh, went to Fred's store and, and they went and talked to him and he, his, his uh, response was, you know, they said, Fred, we're here be, uh, because we feel you may have merchandise that does not belong to you that's in your store. And he's, he was sitting towards the back of the store and he said, didn't really respond and they said, we're gonna have to have a look around. Is it okay if we go down the basement? And he said, his words were, do what you have to do. But he didn't, you know, he wasn't real happy, I'm sure. Um, so, you know, if you think about it, I didn't know the, the police cruisers had come downtown, they were cruising around, they, two guys came into a store and they were going in and out and doing things. And um, it was kind of chaotic. And we were sitting in the store like, oh God, what do, now what do we do, you know? But um, what, what, what are the things that happened after the story came out and things settled down a little bit? People were selling, sending us clippings from all over. We got one from Billings, Montana, and said, cutthroat, cutthroat competition. <laughs> and then I had several customers tell me, did you know that was on the Tonight Show? <laughs> I said, no, you're kidding me. And I never saw it, but they said, Johnny Carson said something like, no. You know, Johnny Carson, no, here's an interesting story. <laughs> Two Minnesota men's clothing retailers were next door neighbors. One was not doing too well, and the other one was and was in trouble, and he found a secret way to get into his competitor's store. He would steal a piece or two every trip or so, and then, you know, he'd have a 100% markup. That's not bad business. In fact, that's a pretty good business plan, he said. <laughs> and uh, he said, and, he said, he must have good taste, because what put him away was the Johnny Carson suit. I kid you not, he said. <laughs> Fred left, after he was sentenced, Fred uh, left New Orleans. He, he saw some jail time, but very little. I better wrap this up because if you have questions. Um, very little, and, and actually the judge asked me how I felt about him going to jail. And honestly, I thought, why? I mean, I don't know what would have done, but he was in for a little while. But then he was doing sentence to serve and all these kinds of things. Uh, so he was he was pun doing self punishment. I know that he was very very remorseful. We got our inventory back, had a giant theft recovery sale, and got enough uh, to get us back on the road to financial recovery. Uh, we took over the head's former space and uh, created a young men's department called the U.S. Mail, the former building. And uh, so the the other one other one question before we wrap this up is, did he have an accomplice? accomplice? I think there may have been because I don't think Fred was healthy and slim enough to crawl through the small openings. I mean, he was not a little guy. He wasn't a big, huge guy, but he wasn't big. Or wasn't a little. So I'm not sure he did. He, he did say in his <coughs> confession, it's right in his confession. I don't think it's in the book, but in his confession. He said, over a 25 year period, I befriended many youngsters from broken families. The children would come into the store and would make some small purchase and just talk. While talking, I realized they did have a problem at home. Therefore, I gave them all the love and attention they, they required that they never received at home. Um, it seemed a little strange to me. 
So there was one person I suspected being his accomplice, but I didn't have enough information to, to know for sure, so I couldn't do anything about it. In 1966, we moved into our new store in the Mark Plotz Mall, on a former, former Breast location. We had six good years, and then the mall began to fail. We closed in 2001. I've been doing a little speaking and writing since then. Connie and I are enjoying life. We are doing some traveling, playing golf, which is interesting, and having fun times with family and friends. <coughs> so a picture of the Jensen boys, I think, on there. Maybe the next one. Anyway, my advice, be happy, be positive, enjoy every day, celebrate, get up in the morning, do your cowboy workout, listen to good rock and roll music like Buddy Holly or these guys and get all fired up and have, make every day special. And remember, beware of night crawlers. <laughs> Merry Christmas and thank you all so much for, company, for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>